This is episode number 258. Can you believe it? With Jill Carver. This is the Plan Air Podcast with Eric Rhodes, publisher and founder of Plan Air Magazine. In the Plan Air Podcast, we cover the world of outdoor painting. Called Plan Air, the French coined the term, which means open air or outdoors. The French pronounce it Plan Air. Others say Plain Air. No matter how you say it, there is a huge movement of artists around the world who are going outdoors to paint. And this show is about that movement. Now, here's your host, author, publisher, and painter, Eric Rhodes. Thank you, Jim Kipping, and welcome to the Plein Air Podcast. I'm Eric Rhodes, and uh, wow, I'm so glad to be here. I'm glad to be anywhere, quite frankly. I, um, I just have not been doing the podcast consistently, and my apologies to you, I've been getting a lot of complaints and it's just like, I don't know what happens. It's just, it, it's been extremely busy and uh, we have not been very good at keeping up on this. So we're, we, we, uh, we had a little talk with myself <laughs> and we're going to get back to this. Uh, we're looking for your ideas and who you would like to have on the podcast in the future. And I just gave a list to my producers and uh, we're going after that. But if you have, have them email me, Eric at, plenairmagazine.com. And, um, you know, there's been a lot going on. So I took a group of people to Japan. I don't think I've talked to you since then. Took a group of people to Japan to paint for 10 days. That was amazing. Then, uh, I had a, just about a week to kind of catch up and, you know, email piles up and everything. And then, and then it was, uh, the plein air convention, uh, plein air convention took place in Asheville, North Carolina, uh, in that area, area, Cherokee, North Carolina. And we painted for four days and we had great things going on and ah, it was just, it was amazing. And, uh, and, and it was one of our biggest, it wasn't our biggest, but it was one of the biggest. And then, uh, and then I came back kind of caught up again. And then I got in the car and I drove up to the Adirondacks, which took me a few days and I had to do that because of the dogs. Then it was a uh, time for the paint Adirondacks publishers invitational retreat, which I did for a week. Uh, and then it's like, I got done with that and I slept for 10 days. Well, maybe not, but it seemed like it. So and anyway, we're getting caught up and I apologize. We'll try to get on top of this, this plus doing a daily YouTube show has <clears throat> a lot going on. Um, I have in the meantime, been able to, uh, get out and paint. I hope the plein air podcast is inspiring you to paint. I hear from people all over the world. As a matter of fact, I just heard from an author who's writing a, a new book about the plein air painting movement, which is really cool. I've heard from people in uh, Ireland recently, UK, um, even Russia. And it's nice to know that we're all kind of one big happy family. The plein air podcast is kind of designed to help us challenge ourselves, think about other things, become better painters. Um, the lifestyle is good because you get to meet lots of people to paint with and hang out with and travel and paint. And the podcast is a chance to get into the mind of the people who do this and their journey and their techniques and why they paint. So I'm grateful that you guys show up and listen. The show would not be the success it is without you. And we've had millions of downloads, which is pretty cool. So thank you for that. At the end of the podcast, we do the Art Marketing Minute. And that's to help you, if you're interested in selling your art, that's to help you sell it. And we also have the Art Marketing Minute as its own separate podcast. You can do that too. Uh, we're going to be talking today about strategy, something that everybody confuses and, and most people get wrong and why you need one. Okay. Now, um, anyway, if you have, uh, I, I want to just remind you, if you have people that you would like to have on the podcast, email me, eric at um, on Air Magazine. Dot com. So, uh, coming up, uh, there's more stuff, you know, this is kind of a lull period and then it's going to get crazy again, but we have pastel live coming up on September 18th through 20th. Um, 
Sometimes some of us want to try new mediums or seek new ways to enhance our creativity. And for decades, artists have turned to pastel for the brilliance and the vibrancy of colors. Pastel painting is a huge worldwide trend and Pastel Live is an online event consisting of three days plus a fourth optional beginners or essentials day. It includes about 30 of the leading pastel artists in the world with demos, lectures, critiques, discussions, and more, plus a chance for you to get to know other artists in discussion rooms and so on. And uh, it's pretty cool. It's a worldwide audience. We have instructors from all over the world, and you should check it out. Um, I started painting pastel because of Pastel Live. I, I was a, an oil painter, and I was, didn't have any, any idea that I would want to paint pastel or watercolor or gouache or any of these other things, but I started doing them because of these events and watching these events and getting excited about it. And as a result, um, I, I, I'm like happier because I can do, you know, like today I did a watercolor painting, um, you know, yesterday I did an oil painting a few days before pastel, you know, it's just kind of fun to be able to pull different things out when I want them. So that's at pastellive.com. Uh, I'm also getting ready to go to my fall color week artist retreat. We're calling it the coastal adventure because it's on in California's Monterey coast. It's sold out. Um, you can get on the wait list in case somebody drops out, but, uh, that's at fallcolorweek.com. And of course, uh, we would love for you to go to the plein air convention in 2025. We announced at the last con convention a few weeks ago that we're going to be doing it in Lake Tahoe and Reno, which is going to be spectacular. Uh, we have probably 75, 80 top expert painters, five stages teaching uh, everything you can imagine. And you can get a ticket now. And, and that is probably already half sold out. It's just like the minute we announce it, whoosh, everybody's buying. That's at plenairconvention.com. Of course, if you're not a subscriber to Plenair Magazine, do it, do it, do it. Okay, Art Marketing Minute coming up after the interview with Jill. Now, um, I also want to just mention that um, I, I recorded a podcast with Jill Carver on stage live at the Plein Air Convention. And Jill was not feeling well. She had a cold and she was just not at the top of her game. I thought she was pretty good, actually. But um, she asked that we redo it. And so I decided because I kind of like the idea of a live audience and we wanted to do a live broadcast to reveal her brand new video series, which I'm sure she'll tell you about. Um, anyway, we wanted to do something about that. And so we recorded uh, what we did the other day. So uh, that's what you're going to hear right now. Here's Jill Carver. Our guest today, Jill Carver, moved to the United States from the UK in 2022 before becoming a full-time professional artist. She was a research assistant at the National Portrait Gallery in London. And we're going to talk to her about that. Uh, and what she learned about painting there. After establishing her name, winning numerous Artist Choice Awards at top plein air events, such as the Laguna Award, the Telluride Easton, uh, she participated in many premier annual shows like the Coors Western Show and the Bighorn Rendezvous. In 2014, she won the gold medal Artist Choice for Best of Show at the Maynard Dixon Country Show, and in the same year was inaugurated into the Plein Air Painters of America, which is the best of the best. Jill Carver, welcome to the Plein Air Podcast. Thank you, Eric. Good well, to be here. Well, you, uh, uh, how does it feel when somebody says you're a master? Is that kind of weird? It's very weird. It's, it makes me squirm a little, I guess. <laughs> um, I think uh, you're um, very generous with your adverbs, put it that way. <laughs> well, I got to tell you that I feel that way, and I think many people do. Um, and that's a big, tall order because we throw those terms around loosely these days a little bit. But, but um, you know, you have have spent a lot of years uh, earning that. And so congratulations on your success and, and you. where you're at. I should mention Jill and I got to know each other because she lived in Austin. Her husband was teaching at a uh, professor at UT. And I have a Wednesday night uh, figure group. And Jill started coming to that for a while. And then... Then they had to move, so we didn't get to spend much time together after that, but it's been a pleasure getting to know you. Uh, one of the things I love about you, Jill, is that you, you're not affected at all. I mean, you have this tremendous ability, this tremendous amount of success, 
and yet, you know, anybody can approach you. You're not, you're not uh, bigger than they are. You don't consider yourself more important than they are. You're just one of us. And I think that's a really wonderful, a wonderful trait. Well, I think this, um, what we do keeps us humble, right? <laughs> Yeah. I mean, it constantly corrects any um, any. So that, that's a really good starting point, Jill, because um, how much of what you paint never sees the light of day, or or how much do you struggle? How many do you do you make a lot of mistakes? Mm -hmm. Do you make as many mistakes as you ever have? I think. Well, it's a great way to start, actually, because um, I think I have gotten better at um, figuring out a good roadmap before I start. And I think um, we all have experience where we kind of jump in very quick um, with all that excitement. And then we get kind of three quarters of the way through and there's this shift that happens. And um, yeah, you kind of lose your way and think, huh, I've kind of strayed here. So, um, yeah, I'm a little better at figuring out where I want to go with a piece up front now. I think that's interesting. You know, I was talking to uh, George Gallo, who's a film director, and he said uh, every film really is more successful if you have a good plan. And it sounds like your roadmap is a plan. Can you tell us a little bit about what your roadmap is? Yeah, so it, it really starts with, um, I, I would say, letting an idea marinate. And I realized this even doing the plein air competitions, you know, um, a decade or so ago, that if you see something that you're really excited by, um, to just sit in that moment for a little bit, maybe make some notes, um, come back the next day. I, I think I excelled at the plein air competitions because I went for um kind of quality over quantity and um the i realized the best paintings i did was if perhaps if i'd noticed something the day before and then you kind of go to sleep on it and you give it that time to kind of marinate and let the idea behind something evolve that i would end up with a better result you know um generally speaking if we put a little forethought into something we end up with something better and um I used to have on my um, workshop handouts a quote by John Ruskin that wrote the elements of drawing. Um, quality is never an accident. It is always the result of in intelligent effort. And uh, I know we all want to jump into the coloring in part and the painting part is the fun part. But uh, yeah, if we put a little thought into it up front, we tend to end up with better results. So what if you're not in a scenario like that? Let, let's say, you know, I, I took a group of people to Japan. We're in different places every day. We don't have the luxury of going back to that place. Uh, do you have some kind of a planning process or tool that you use uh, to help you get the best possible outcome if, if you know you can't come back and this is your only chance to paint there? Well, I think even, you know, even if you, in a, like a plain air situation where you have to react like immediately and, and get what you can out of that experience down fast. Um, for me, even five minutes just sitting there with those thoughts um, tends to clarify what it is I want to capture. And then, to be honest, in a plain air situation now, I, I tend to change my expectation. I'm not going for a finished product. I'm really chasing color notes and information, you know, down that surround that idea. Oh, well, that makes a lot of sense. Are you doing any uh, preliminary sketches or anything like that? Um, yes, if I have a sketchbook with me, I, I do, yeah. But I tend to, um, I tend to now create, you know, for years I did plein air competitions and so forth where you really were, the intention was to finish something that was frameable, that was complete. And now when I go out, I really don't. And it's amazing how much pressure that takes off of you. Um, pressure can be very distracting, actually. It can make you kind of fill in things. It can make you wing things if the lights change. And actually, if you just stay in that moment and say, okay, I've got 45 minutes, 
let me see what I can get that's, you know, accurate color notes from what I'm looking at. You end up with uh, richer material that by all means, then you can go back to the studio with photographs and notes and, and maybe pull something out of that. Well, you, you know, you're a member of the Plein Air Painters of America, which is the elite group of painters. And I remember somebody, maybe Matt Smith once told me, he said, our goal of Plein Air Painting, or he said, anyway, my goal of Plein Air Painting is not to create a finished work. It's to, it's to inform something that will be used in a bigger work, a studio piece or something like that. So is that kind of how you look at these, these it studies? Is. It is, yes. And uh, at one point, I almost fired myself from the Plain Air Paints of America because I had changed the way I function outdoors to such an extent that I rarely, rarely finish something that's frameable. Um, I tend to keep them as studies and they tend to be incomplete. You tend to still see some of the canvas. Um, but as an organization, what we really wanted to do was kind of reestablish that outdoor work regardless of if you're getting a few notes down and a few sketches down through to fairly highly rendered pieces. And Matt Smith is the master of doing that within a very short time slot. Um, we wanted to kind of expand what the definition of plein air is and kind of identify that it functions very differently for a lot of different people, but it's still an absolutely crucial part of the process. Well, there, there, you know, there are purists out there, and I'm not being critical of anyone, uh, but, you know, we hear from them all because of Plein Air Magazine. So, you know, some people will get really hung up on what is the definition of a Plein Air painting, you know, and right. so some people are like, it's not a Plein Air painting if you ever touch it the minute you bring it back, you know, to the studio. My, my belief is that if you look throughout history at all the great paintings, these people wanted to create great paintings. That was their goal. Their goal was not to do a finished piece on location. Maybe they did, maybe they didn't. But I think that, uh, you know, we have hurt ourselves in some ways by, uh, and, and by the way, this movement is wonderful and I've had a lot to do with some of it, but the idea of, of you know, that you have to complete something in perfection mode when you're outdoors, you know, it's not always gonna work. And, right. and you know, probably, uh, two out of five, maybe I'll get something I'm I'm proud to use. Last week at Publishers Invitational, I probably did 11 or 12 paintings, and, and I had two that I finished on location that I was happy that I could throw in a frame without any changes, but the others all need more work. Right, right. I think... Um... I think we've become quite product orientated as society. You know, um, we define artists by the work that ends up in frames um, and in galleries or in shows. And I think all of us that participate working outdoors directly in some form or other really know and appreciate that the experience itself is actually what really, really counts. And for me now, I go outside to to um, I really go out with this kind of student mentality of what I'm looking at. So I'm not going out trying to claim a product. I'm going out with a student mentality of trying to learn something. And for me, that is a gathering as accurate color notes as I can. And for me, it's discovering ideas, you know, and that, that comes. It's the one thing that AI will never be able to take away from us is the actual experience of being there immersed um, and totally absorbed by that process. Well, let's see. We'll find out if there are robots out there with easels that are looking looking at the scene and interpreting the scene. I think well, I'm not giving up that time and I'm sure you're not either. So, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I mean, it, it doesn't get better, right? Um, in terms of experience and being totally absorbed and in the moment, um, that's as magical as life gets, I think. Yeah. And, and I know this is probably a stupid question, but does it ever get easier? <laughs> so I think I have this conversation with my students all the time, Eric. There is this perception that at some ability level that the journey smooths out and is a little less of a roller coaster. Um, and uh, the problem is, is that as you advance in terms of ability, 
that you end up with yet another spectrum of questions and searchings and explorations and lines of inquiry in your head that you're wanting to chase and follow. And um, I always tell my students, you know, that feeling of frustration never goes away because as you advance, you've still got this kind of infinite, um, unattainable goal of even more things that you want to learn. And so I try and flip that on its head and say, you know, frustration is your friend. And if you if you feel it, it means that you're still in the mode of uh, having an inquisitive mind, of, of exploring, of wanting to learn more. And we're never going to get there, are we? We're never going to be the artists that we want to be. And I always feel like um, John Carlson had this quote that knowledge precedes execution. Like I think as we learn, it, you know, those light bulb moments, those epiphanies are in our head first before they consistently come out on the canvas. And there is a time delay there. Um, and I think for me, and I paint every day, for me, that time delay of being able to transfer something new that I've learned consistently on the canvas is probably six months to a year now. So within that time frame, am I frustrated that it's not quite coming out as I want it to yet? You bet. It's always there. Well, I think, though, that you're, you're right about that. Embrace, embracing the, the struggle uh, and, and I think that that's something that I wish, you know, an instructor had said to me when I first started painting is, look, this is going to be hard. Um, yeah, I can teach you some things that are going to help you smooth the way and it's going to make it a little faster, but you're just going to have to get there, get the brush time. You're going to have to make a lot of mistakes. And when you find yourself frustrated, that's when you're about to break through. And right. I wish somebody had said that to me when I when I went through, you know, five instructors who just were all not able to get to reach me. Maybe they reached other people, but they didn't reach me. So I want to, I want to delve into a little bit of your history here, because I think it's so important. We talked about this on stage at the plein air convention. You had a very special job uh, before you ever became a painter, if I understand it. And that was uh, your job at, at the museums in London. Can you tell us a little bit about that and what you did? Yeah, so um, I was very, very fortunate to um, get a job at the National Portrait Gallery in London as a um, curatorial research assistant in their archive and library. It has a huge research department that extends to British portraiture in general beyond the gallery's own collection. Um, and I worked in that department. We had a vast library, but we also had a vast um, research room. Um, if anyone follows the TV program Fake or Fortune, uh, you see quite a lot of the room where I actually worked in that program. It's a British art dealer called um, Philip Mould um, that leads that program on TV. I know a lot of my American friends follow it, but that's where I worked, um, and it's where we would do research into British portraits. And um, you told me at the convention, I don't remember your answer, what was the most important painting that you actually held in your hands? So, yeah, so, oh, it would be a tough choice, you know. Um, there was There's so many special pieces in that gallery collection. I was trained as an art handler and did a, just occasional courier trips, and um, manage photography sessions back in the day where you would have to replace transparencies every few months rather than, you know, now it's permanent digital scan, so it's kind of a little easier. Um, but, yeah, there was, um, there's like a 1603 portrait of Elizabeth I, um, and I remember it's on, it's on three panels, three cradled panels, that fit into a cradle, you know, it's just warped over time. It was done on wood, three wooden panels um, stuck together. And, um, you know, to be in the uh, Hans Holbein miniatures, um, Holbein's uh, Whitehall Palace mural of Henry VIII, I mean, there's a lot of, I was a history um, graduate, British history graduate of 
the 17th century. So, um, yeah, I got to handle a lot of things. And just incredible, as magical objects. I think we forget that paintings are objects as well as depictions. And to consider them as historical objects, you know, where you're sharing the same airspace as someone did in the 16th century is incredible. Yeah, to be to be able to hold, I remember one time I, I had a chance on one of our fine art trips to hold a, a Van Gogh painting and to, and to and to look at it and to look at it closely and and I just felt like you know he touched this same panel maybe right. not the frame but right. but uh, you know we we got his neurons interpreting that that scene that's so special what do you think uh, because you studied uh, historical artists uh, what do you think applies to what you can pass on to the rest of us that we need to know that would be valuable information based on that that touch with history in terms of them being objects well you tell me in terms of objects and, and or in terms of maybe how we should be treating our our um, our canvases or our underpainting oh right yeah i mean it definitely made me very aware of you know archival processes and um not to be obsessive about it because i think that can make you very very precious in terms of not experimenting enough um but yeah certainly in terms of um you know canvases quality gesso on top um definitely quality uh stretcher bars to stop things from warping and um, definitely, you know, part of my job was to research portraits um, that didn't have a provenance, that lost their provenance or they'd lost their identity of the sitter or the attribution of the artist. And um, so I, I'm a little obsessive with marking up the back of my canvases now. Um, I have a rubber studio stamp. I have an inventory number that cross-relates to a ledger here. Um, I sign it in a couple of places um, I might mark up the frame too. So it's made me very aware of it as an object, you know, that you're- Yeah, you told me, I think you told me at the convention, you signed the back of the painting, but you also signed the stretcher bar. Yes, I do. Yeah. Why, yeah. why, do you, why, why the stretcher bar? Because that's, that's likely to get changed over the years. Well, I mean, certainly from an historical point of view, you see canvases that, are, that have been um, restretched quite often. So sometimes, you know, the canvas is removed from the stretcher bar and restretched or laid on panel. Um, so, yeah, it's like every component of that sign the front and make sure your signature is under the varnish and that you don't varnish the painting first because you want to photograph it and then you forget to sign it. Make sure the signature is underneath the varnish. So let's talk about tools because that's what this, this broadcast is really about. You have developed a process of, um, that, that you've shared in your workshops. And I understand you're not doing as much workshop work because you want to work on bigger pieces and so on. So help us understand the tools that you think are essential that all of us can benefit from. Well, um, the tools I use, I, I use the word tools because um, it's a shorter word, but what I'm really referring to are principles or fundamentals. And um, just over years of years and years of teaching, I've tried to refine and resolve in my head what makes a good painting. And I have a broad appreciation for, I would say, a variety of styles. I was exposed to a lot of art in London um, just through living there for 12 years. And a lot of different genres, a lot of different styles. And regardless of style, it's always intrigued me as to, you know, what's the common denominator in making a good painting? And what do we mean by that? And for me, I, I think I went on quite, you know, the long, um, the long um, journey and trying to resolve this in my head and simplify it. And I think I finally come to the conclusion that regardless of style, a good painting, when we say it's, it's a good painting, what we mean by that is harmony. What do we mean by a painting being harmonious? 
And I've come to the conclusion, and this is kind of maybe a little unique to how I think of art in, and painting in general, but I think when we think of harmony, we're thinking of unity and variety in shape, value, and color. So it's come from quite a elongated journey to say maybe it's that simple. Maybe it's that simple. Unity and variety in shape, value, and color. And every painting needs unity somehow in those three ingredients to make it hang together. And then we need a certain balance of variety to make it interesting. Now, if we go overboard on the variety, maybe it feels over-rendered, overworked, over-busy, and is no longer harmonious to the eye. So I think it's that kind of beautiful balance with those three ingredients, but throughout those three ingredients, finding unity and variety. So uh, we have a pretty monumental event, and that is that uh, we uh, have been working, we started talking five years ago uh, and have gone through, you, you wanted this project to be the perfect project because it's kind of your life's work. And so five years ago, we began this process of, of creating something that was special and unique, unlike anything that we've done before. You want to tell us a little bit about it? Yes. Um, and I'm so glad you stuck with me, Eric. You, I don't know if you remember, but five years ago when you first approached me, with the idea of doing an instructional DVD, um, you'd, you'd approached me before about it. And I was like, oh, I'm not ready. Oh, I'm not good enough. <laughs> and then, um, you know, in the meantime, I'd kind of been developing these design workshops. And then five years ago, you came to me with the magic words. Do you remember what those magic words were? I do not. You said to me, this video can be whatever you want it to be, Jill. We will do it. And I thought, as soon as you said those words, it can be whatever you want it to be. I thought, well, what a marvelous opportunity. What a generous um, gesture of faith and trust. <laughs> and, um, yeah, it was, um, it was like, oh, maybe I can somehow capture the contents of a of an entire workshop that focuses on design in video format. Like how powerful a resource might that be? Well, and you spent a lot of time developing those concepts so that you could represent it properly. You know, one of the things that we don't think about is that we spend a lifetime learning how to paint. And sometimes we study under someone who spent a lifetime learning to paint and they passed it on to us. Yeah. But but oftentimes, you know, things happen and we're not able to pass those things along. You know, most people like who who like yourself have gotten to a stage of their life. It's like, I don't want to do any more plein air events or I don't want to do them very often. Um, a teaching is nice, but I want to be able to focus on, you know, my monumental work and my best work. And so what happens is that a lot of times people get to a stage like yours where they say, I'm not doing these anymore, or I'm maybe going to do one a year or very rarely. And so uh, we don't get the chance to touch as many people. And what's nice about this is we've created a historical record of your entire workshop process. And uh, it's kind of unlike anything that we've done before. What I'd like to do real briefly, Jill, is to play the promo and then have you talk about it, okay? okay. Let's play that now. Design and composition is an essential foundation for any good painting. Too often we jump into the painting part without spending enough thinking time planning it. I'll be saving you from that painful process where you spend 80% of your time correcting and refining the painting once you've already started. If you come up with a design plan that suits your subject matter and your concept, you have a roadmap for moving forward and the rest is just coloring in. I've decided to split my teaching of these design tools into two videos. One, Tools Explained, where we'll look at each tool in depth and go through demos and exercises together. The second video, Tools Applied, is where you'll see me 
complete two paintings using two tools in each one, the very different subject matter, and I'll be choosing those tools according to that subject matter and the concept. Primarily, I want you to realize that creativity is found in design, those individual choices that you make as you come up with a plan. I want you to realize that design is actually where the fun is at. And I want you to realize that just spending 30 minutes exploring design options using the tools I present will improve your work infinitely. We'll also be looking at some real life situations where I'll be indicating to you which tool I consider to be the go-to tool for that subject matter and concept. I base this workshop on the teaching format I've been using for the last few years and I've really seen some light bulbs come on. So I hope you'll come on this journey with me, learn these tools and realize the vast creative possibilities that lie ahead for you. Well, congratulations on that. That's, uh, you know, we, we work with uh, a lot of artists, as you know, and you have been, uh, and I say this in the nicest possible way, you've been the most picky. <laughs> <laughs> And that's a good thing because, you know, you you said, I don't want to show, you know, I don't want to show every time I clean my brush, I, you know, and you're making us edit these things, really fine tune this. And, and, you know, that's so good because it just makes for a better product. So, well, we, also, we also had a lot of footage to get through, you know, they were here for eight days filming. So it was a massive, massive filming pop you know component and then it's been huge in terms of editing yeah well it's like four cameras times eight days of footage, right, it's a exactly. lot, a lot of footage. yeah it's uh, but you know it's it's probably likely to be the uh, the biggest release of the year and one of the biggest releases if not the biggest release we've ever had um so it's it's quite a monumental effort um what what would you tell people about uh, why you think, it, without being pitchy or salesman -y, because mm -hmm. I know you're not that, but what what are they going to get out of this? So I think it, it's a it's a workshop that I've been teaching for the last five six years that I called Aesthetic Tools for Landscape Design, and it's based on you know the realizations I've had in my own journey as a painter, which is that I think I think a lot of landscape um, composition theory is quite traditional in that its intention is that as a painter, um, we reproduce this 3D magical trick on a 2D surface and we design it so that the viewer can walk, walk, walk in literally. And I've always come to painting, landscape painting with a little bit of a different perspective, a bit of a broader perspective. And I think that's largely informed um, by my own taste in art, which is quite informed by a kind of modernist movement in Britain that happened, you know, first and second world war era. And I know modernism is a dirty word <laughs> um, uh, to some folks, but for me, the one thing that they really brought back to the table was that you know, landscape is landscape and painting is painting. And as an artist, what we are doing is actually producing what is a decorative panel to hang on a wall and to, to consider it as an object and to kind of expand that mindset kind of beyond, well, we're trying to recreate this 3D image that floats somewhere within this frame but to actually, you know, claim those four edges, claim the four corners and really design within them. Um, and I also think that there's a point as an artist, right, when we all start out, we're all trying to copy what's out there. I mean, it's quite a challenge when you're starting to copy what's out there. I think then as we grow and evolve and learn, there's that realization that we have to start assuming the role of editor, that we can make it a better painting within those four hard edges if we assume the role of editor. And I think editing and design conversation has often been limited to what I call division and placement, moving things around. 
And the point of this workshop is for all those landscape painters out there that somehow um, realize that their design actually involves more than just, you know, maybe dividing on thirds or maybe moving a tree across to a vertical that lines up with a mountain, that design does actually encompass shape, value, and color. And so I introduced these, what I call these tools, but they're kind of like aesthetic fundamentals on how do we manage shape, value, and color to make stronger principles. And what's really fascinating to me about this process, and I view this project as a kind of collaboration between myself and my students who've offered themselves as guinea pigs over the last few years, knowing full well that this content was going to be produced in video form, was, you know, these tools that can help us manage our design in terms of corralling too much variety, chasing too much variety, in terms of imposing a unifying simple structure underneath, those same tools can help corral and manage, but they can also be catalysts for creativity. And that's what I really embrace in this video. And I, I want people to realize, and if you've been on that journey of rendering and you kind of feel like maybe you're stuck in repeating the same process to any given subject matter, that you just have a method and a way of working, that um, you can kind of recalibrate um, your design sensibilities. I, I put a lot of emphasis on shape, which I think gets overlooked. Um, you see a lot of theory on color and value. Um, so I try and get people to really realize the power of shape and how shape alone can actually totally override and trump color and value in terms of its pulling power. Um, but generally speaking, these tools, you know, to simplify, to strengthen, to, de to design can also be catalysts. So there's a lot of emphasis on, you know, taking the seed of intention, taking a concept and realizing that creativity exists in those initial design choices. And uh, Rick Rubin, who's written a new book called um, The Creative Act, A Way of Being, I think it's called, um, his analogy is, uh, and it's a, it's a very good one that I use, is that, you know, you, when you see a subject matter that you really respond to, it's not a scene that you're responding to. It's something about that scene that you're having an emotional response to, is to identify that as a concept and sow it as a seed of intention. And then if you imagine a plant or a tree growing from that seed of intention, Every time you have a branch breaking off, that is a design choice. And what I want people to do with this video is actually use these tools to really kind of explore their creative imagination. Um, so yeah, it's totally based on my background. My own journey as an artist is that realization would be the best pain I would be. Um, you know, be more concept intention based, but be more creative in terms of my explorations before I start a painting, kind of explore the what ifs. I'm glad to hear you say that. I think that we all struggle with a little bit of this <coughs> rendering disease. And, and, you know, some people render beautifully, but one of the trends that I've certainly seen at the plein air shows and the people seem to be winning the awards are the people who are designing more, they're more abstract in, in the approach, abstract shapes, and, 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 and just having more fun with it and, and not being under the pressure to create a photographic representation in oil paint, which I think is kind of where we all begin. It's, it's interesting, as I watch artists over time, it seems that a lot of them start there, you know, the idea of, of creating a Hudson River School style painting, and there's nothing wrong with that, of course. And then some of them just move more and more and more towards abstraction and, and big shapes and, 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 you know, just interesting objects um, and, and to make them more interesting. And I think yeah. that's I, I try, you know, when I'm talking about these fundamentals and principles, Eric, I'm really aware that I think they transcend styles, you know, and regardless of my own personal sensibilities, I think, you know, even if you look at, 
you know, Thomas Moran's painting is of the Grand Canyon. I would call those fairly representational. There's a lot of detail. But when you realize that there's been composing and editing and design going on, I think as you evolve as an artist and you realize that even the most detailed renderers are still composing, uh, you realize that there's a lot more to it. But, right. you know, I just judge Wayne Plain here. And to me, the standouts in those competitions, and this is what I emphasize in the video, the standouts are the ones that have ideas singular ideas, concepts. They're not just painting a scene. They are um, celebrating an idea. Like they've started off with a very strong idea. So regardless of style, how much detail, how much abstraction is going on, the real standouts in that show. And there were some phenomenal pieces. Where well, I, I certainly like intentional. That. Yeah, and I, I think that's right, being intentional. I, I certainly would like to learn how to stand out. Well, Jill, uh, I want to thank you for being on the Plain Air podcast. Uh, it's really been a joy to have you today. Thank you, Eric, and thanks for the opportunity to make the video. Well, I want to thank Jill Carver again. Um, her new video uh, is turning out to be one of the biggest sellers we've ever had and one of the best ever. Um, and as she mentioned, you know, it's it, we, we were there for days. Um, it's uh, three videos. Uh, there's one called The Tools Explained, which is number one. There's number two is tools applied. Each of them have demos into it in a lot of depth. And then uh, number three is actually a combination of video one and two. It's the ultimate collection. And so check that out. You can get them at painttube.tv. Jill, thank you again for, for, for being such a great inspiration. Now let's go to the Art Marketing Minute. This is the Marketing Minute with Eric Rhodes, author of the number one Amazon bestseller, Make More Money Selling Your Art. Proven techniques to turn your passion into profit. I want to tell you guys that you can send your questions to me, eric at artmarketing.com, or you can uh, come live on the podcast uh, during the marketing minute to ask your questions. The other thing is I'm doing marketing Mondays now for my uh, YouTube show, Art School Live. It's on YouTube and Facebook, and I'm answering questions there. Uh, and a lot of people are on there live too. So there's a lot of options on art marketing and more to come. Hmm, I wonder what that means. Uh, okay, so here's the first question from Tim Matthews, who is near Myrtle Beach, uh, North Carolina. I think that's North Carolina, or is it South? Yeah. Tim says, I'm a landscape painter. I've been painting for many years, and I want to use my passion to earn a good living. I've read your book on art marketing, and it's a tremendous help. Thank you. In your opinion, is it wiser to seek representation and sell through galleries, or simply represent yourself. I've heard so many different thoughts on this. I'm not sure what to think. I live near Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. There doesn't seem to be much of an art market here, so I assume self-representing would mean focusing mainly on online sales. Uh, I'm learning more about the art market every day and trying to do uh, and make the best career decisions I can. Tim, you're a rock star, man. Thank you for sending in a question. Tim. Um, I, I, I was, I was talking to somebody yesterday and one of my big frustrations is that I teach art marketing and have taught art marketing for a dozen years. And a lot of people pay attention, but a lot of people don't do what it takes. And sometimes they don't do what it takes is because they just don't want to do it. Right. They want the results. They want the money. They want the sales. They want the customers but they're not willing to do what it takes. And this person I was talking to yesterday was saying, you know, I, I'm doing things that nobody else is doing because they're not willing to do what it takes. And I think that's true. So the, you know, the thing you have to understand is if you're going to do your own art marketing, well, first off, if you're going to sell paintings at all or paintings or drawings or whatever your art is, ceramics or photography, you have to understand that you have to make a lifetime commitment to marketing. As long as you intend to make your living from your art, you have to have a lifetime commitment to marketing. Marketing is not a one-time thing. It's not like, okay, I'm going to run an ad and then I'll have all the customers I need for the rest of my life. It doesn't work that way. I wish it did. As a matter of fact, it takes three to five years, five to seven years, 10 years. And 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 the reason I, I put that in different packages is that, you know, 
you kind of get to different levels of success. You're building momentum. It doesn't happen overnight. And, you know, I've seen things happen overnight. I've orchestrated careers that happened overnight, but there's a lot of money spent to be able to do that. And it doesn't always work. Um, so you got to do it in a very thoughtful way. So the, the first thing I always tell people is spend 20% of your time on your marketing. And when you're first launching, uh, build up your, your inventory of paintings and then spend 100% of your time on your marketing for a while because you know you have paintings you don't need to make more paintings right now so spend all that time doing all the things you need to do now even if you have a gallery or even if you have an agent which is another option you did not mention um you still have to do a lot of work you cannot rely a hundred percent imagine if um you had a hundred percent of your income relying on somebody else and that person um decided to leave, decided to get sick, decided to die, you know, something like that, all of a sudden you have no income, right? So you as the product manager, product creator, you have to always make sure that you've got something going on and you've got to be managing your gallery relationships and you might want to have other alternatives as well. Um, a lot of people do, a lot of people will sell direct, but you have to, work that out with your galleries because there's certain things you shouldn't do. But the idea is that you want to be responsible for your career and you want to be working it. So no matter what you do, you're going to be working it. Now, getting to your the heart of your question, is it wiser to seek representation than sell through galleries? I think the first thing is you, you know yourself. You know yourself and you know, am I going to be disciplined enough to do what it takes? Am I going to be willing to spend the time it takes do I, am I willing to spend the time studying? Now, the good news is you read my book. Thank you for that. And you at least are applying yourself. And so I'd say you probably have a good chance of success because you're, you're, you're already taking the right kinds of steps. So the reality is that you can't rely 100% on anything. So you really need to do both, right? You need to represent yourself, but you also need uh, to consider representing yourself to galleries. Now, like I said, there is the option of an agent. Um, there are people out there who are agents who can uh, help you get into galleries, help you build shows, help you do a lot of different things. They're going to take some uh, percentage of your income in exchange for that. In some cases, they're going to ask you to pay them a flat fee up front to get, get started. That's okay too. But uh, I think that if I, were, uh, if I were starting from scratch, I would probably say uh, do both. And I like to, I, I'm in three galleries. Um, I'm about to leave one of those galleries and upgrade uh, to a higher level gallery. And, and the reason I'm going to be leaving the gallery is going to be closing. And so it's a good opportunity. I don't want to have more than three galleries because I can't give them enough work. Um, sometimes it sells, sometimes it doesn't. And sometimes that's my fault. And sometimes that's their fault. Um, they always think it's our fault and, and uh, maybe it is, maybe our paintings aren't good enough, but you know, the reality is you want galleries who are going to be working it. They're going to be selling They're They're going to be really trying to figure out how to do the best things for you. So I, you know, and, and we all kind of go through this stage of first, first level galleries. Sometimes you have to get into a first level gallery before you can get into a second tier gallery or third tier gallery. And, and they're not rated that way, but it kind of depends. Like if, uh, you know, a top tier gallery might be a New York gallery that carries, um, you know, Andrew Wyeth paintings. And to get in there, I mean, you, you might have to be at that level and it might take you 10 years or 15 or 20 years or a lifetime to get there. So I think um, I would, I would go for it. Um, getting, getting into galleries, uh, you know, I explained in my book, uh, and that's really an introduction process. You really don't want to be approaching them directly. I don't think so. Uh, I know how they, uh, they feel about that and that doesn't usually work well with most of them. Some of them don't mind it, but, um, you want to just get to the point where, you know, you have, you have some way that you can sell direct and you have some way you can sell, uh, to galleries. You know, my friend Chong Wong has a deal with his galleries is that anything under a certain size, he can sell direct. So he does the daily painting thing and he'll, you know, he'll sell a painting every day that might be an eight by 10 or a five by seven or something like that. But the bigger paintings go to his gallery. And of course, pricing changes for that. So I hope that's been helpful. 
and uh, let me know what happens. Reach out when you have your next question. Next, we have a question from Evan Crest in Tennessee. Hey, it sounds like we're hitting the South this week, All right, We got North Carolina and Tennessee right next to each other. Uh, Evan says, how do I create a marketing strategy that aligns with my goals? Well, you know, it, it, it's that, that's a difficult question because Evan, strategy is determined by your goals and tactics are determined by your strategy. So let's say that your goal is to sell 30 paintings a year at $2,000 a painting net, net meaning that that's what you keep, right? That's not, you know, if you're selling them through the gallery, you still got to figure out how you're going to get $2,000 a painting. So, you you know, that's, that's $60,000 in income, right? Minus whatever your expenses are internally. So you've got to ask yourself, what, how do I get there? Well, if you already are there, you already are doing it, then you already know how to get there. You just r- rinse and repeat, right? Uh, but maybe you're doing half of that and you've got to figure out, okay, how do I double it? Or maybe you're not doing any of it and you got to figure out how do I get there completely? So it's tough, you know, launching from the beginning is, is tough, but you know, everything is tough in life and anything that's good re- requires some pain and some discomfort and you're okay with that. So if strategy is your plan of action, uh, it is tied to your customer. So l- let me just repeat that. Strategy is a plan of action. It's tied to your customer. So you need to know who is my customer, who is likely to buy my paintings. Well, the best place to find that out is if you've sold paintings in the past, who has bought my paintings in the past? You know, I I have a deal with um, uh, at least one of my art galleries. And and I say to them, look, I want to know, I want to know everything about the buyer. I don't need to know their name. Although I do ask them to, to send me a, a, you know, an address and a name so I can send them a note card and say, thank you. Um, and I guarantee them I'm not going to try to sell them something different or at least go around the gallery. And I, you know, I send them a nice thank you note, but oftentimes I'll, if I can get a chance to call them, I'll call them and I'll just get to know them. I just wanted to thank you for uh, buying my painting and tell me a little bit about yourself and then just shut up and listen because, uh, you know, you'll hear, well, I'm a retired executive from, you know, uh, some company and, and my wife is a retired executive from this company or we're retired lawyers or we, we work as lawyers or we, you know, whatever it is. And, um, you try to, you know, try to get a little information like, you know, what is it about the painting that they love and where is it going to hang? And what is it about them? You And, and then if you talk to five or six or 10 or 20 customers, you're going to start looking for patterns. Is there anything in common? Well, the one thing in common is it seems to be the people who buy my paintings all seem to be over 50. And they all seem to be professionals. And so that tells you something. And now the question is, and, and by the way, they all seem to live in this particular community. And that might be related to the gallery, or it might be they're all on vacation in this particular community and they're coming from different places. So you want to learn these things so that you can kind of design your, your strategy. Your strategy includes your pricing, your packaging, your advertising, packaging, I know it seems odd, but when I say packaging, it's like the back of your painting. How are you going to do that? Um, how do you deal with your customer service for customers, meaning customers, meaning galleries? How are you going to deal with customers' discussions with customers themselves? Your follow-up, your customer retention, your internet plan, your customer engagement, your website, all that stuff. It starts with who your ideal customer is. What do they want? What do they need? Where do you find them? Uh, and what do you do to take action to get them to buy? What was it that put them over the fence and decided to buy that? And it might have been some little thing like the story, or it might have been the colors, or it might, you know, there are a lot of different things. And so you just want to be looking for patterns. And then, you know, how do I reach these people? How do I find them? How much repetition do I do to reach them? And so on. Now, it's best to have some background. Uh, some experience in a particular strategy, but you don't always get that benefit. So you can do some research and uh, the research can help you. For instance, uh, somebody was talking to me about wanting to reach um, retired people. And, um, 
And so I, you know, I said, okay, well, let's research retired people. And we went through and said, you know, okay, how many people are retiring in America every year? And how many people who are retired actually have any money? And there are, it turns out there are a lot of affluent people who retire, former professionals. Um, and so where do they live? How do you reach them? What kinds of things do they like to do? You know, if somebody's retired, it doesn't mean they're old. Um, and old is a relative term anyway. Um, you know, a lot of people who are early retirement age will buy a new house downsize and they'll say, you know what? I want all new furniture. That's what my wife did. Uh, we didn't retire, but it's like we bought a new house and she said, I don't want the old furniture anymore. I want all new furniture. We've had this stuff for 30 years. So that's the kind of thing that, that uh, you, you, okay, if, if you're looking for somebody who's buying new houses when they retire, uh, what area are they in? How do you reach them? Where are they going to go shopping? What, what kinds of things are they paying attention to? Where can you put your artwork on display? Are there restaurants that they're going to? Uh, you know, if they're high-end restaurants, then uh, regular retired people who are on fixed incomes and don't have any money um, aren't going to go to those high-end restaurants. So be in the high-end restaurants where the money is or in the country club or at the golf club or, you know, wherever. So try to figure out where people are and where they want to go. Now, I had an artist... <clears throat> He told me, my strategy is to help people who could not normally afford paintings, but I want them to own my artwork because I can't afford paintings. I said, okay, how'd that go for you? He says, well, uh, I worked really hard at it for a year and I didn't sell anything. And uh, he said, because nobody could ever afford anything. And, you know, I, I wanted to tell him, I probably did tell him actually. And I think the idea here is there's an old philosophy and it, the philosophy is stand in the river where the money is flowing. You, if Tony Robbins said something like this, I was on stage. I mean, he was on stage and, uh, he, and he said, no matter how good you are, no matter how smart you are, no matter how good your product is, if you are, uh, serving a declining market, or if you're in an area where nobody buys it, uh, imagine that you're selling uh, heaters, portable heaters in, I don't know, Mexico or Tucson or something. I mean, your, your chances of people needing portable heaters is going to be slim. Um, you know, it's kind of like the idea of selling ice cubes to Eskimos, right? So I think that you want to look for places. So this guy needed to stand in the river where the money is flowing. Once he switched his mindset to, they don't have to be like me. I, they just have to be people who love my artwork and want to buy it. Well, that changes everything. Um, stand in the river where the money's flowing. So, um, you know, it, it really boils down to where are they buying homes? Where are they frequently, frequently uh, frequenting restaurants, stores, et cetera. And then there's tactics and tactics are, okay, how am I going to advertise? Where am I going to advertise? How much money am I going to spend? How much repetition? Uh, you know, am I going to do newspaper ads local? Am I going to do the art scene local things? Am I going to do national publications like Fine Art Connoisseur, Plein Air? Um, and it's going to involve a lot of different tactics because you can't just do one thing. You got to do multiple things because one thing might not work and everything takes time. So just keep in mind that uh, it, you just got to think all that stuff through. And, you know, I, I have some marketing courses online on PaintTube.tv and some things that I've done, Art Marketing Bootcamp. They're helpful. Um, and they might be able to answer some of those questions for you. But, um, you know, you just got to gotta just jump in and try things. Anyway, that's the marketing more than a minute. <laughs> I hope it helps. This has been the Marketing Minute with Eric Rhodes. You can learn more at artmarketing.com. Thanks for listening to the Plan Air Podcast. And do not forget to send me your questions, eric at artmarketing.com. Thanks again to um, Jill Carver. It was great having her on. Uh, get her video at painttube.tv. It is, it, it is remarkable. Um, also, yeah, we'd love to have you at Pastel Live. Just check it out at pastellive.com. We also have a bunch of other virtual conferences coming up. We've got a Realism Live coming up, Watercolor Live coming up, and Acrylic Live coming up, brand new, and then Plein Air Live. Um, 
check out the new Plan Air Convention. It's going to be in Tahoe. It's already half gone. And get in early. You know, that way you can pay for it in payments and not have to worry about it. Uh, PlanAirConvention.com. And uh, if you want to get on the wait list for Fall Color Week, even though it's sold out, uh, check it out, fallcolorweek.com. And of course, get the magazine. If you don't have Plein Air Magazine, well, you're missing. You're missing, baby. Got a great editor, Kelly Kane. She's awesome. Uh, pleinairmagazine.com. And I have a blog called Sunday Coffee. Check it out. It's where I talk about art and life and things. I'm also on daily on Facebook and YouTube. Show is called Art School Live, where we have hundreds of artists doing demonstrations and talks. And it's noon Eastern every weekday. We do marketing Mondays and we do feedback Fridays, where we give critiques. You can subscribe on YouTube by searching Art School Live and hit the subscribe button. Also, please follow me on all social media. I'm I'm on all of them. That's at Eric Rhodes. Okay. And that's me, at Eric Rhodes, publisher and founder of Plen Air Magazine, Fine Art Connoisseur, and others. Thank you for your time today. And get out and get some Plen Air painting done. It's a wonderful season for doing that. It's a, it, Unless you're in Australia or something, and then it's cold. But do it anyway. It's a big world out there. Go paint it. We'll see you. Bye-bye. This has been the Plen Air Podcast with Plen Air Magazine's Eric Rhodes. You can help spread the word about plein air painting by sharing this podcast with your friends. And you can leave a review or subscribe on iTunes so it comes to you every week. And you can even reach Eric by email, eric at plenairmagazine.com. Be sure to pick up our free ebook, 240 Plein Air Painting Tips by some of America's top painters. It's free at plenairtips.com. Tune in next week for more great interviews. Thanks for listening.